Welcome to the next episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Today, I'm going to dive into a discussion of how oracles work on the Ethereum blockchain. Now, many of the concepts I'm going to talk about in this lecture are actually applicable to many blockchains besides Ethereum, uh, but I will be using specific examples from the Ethereum blockchain. So oracles are systems that can provide external data sources to Ethereum smart contracts. The term oracle comes from the Delphi at Oracle, the, uh, at Oracle uh, which was um, something that actually happened in real life for thousands of years. People went to Delphi to get answers from the oracle. And it was believed that the person who was answering those questions was in communication with the gods who could see visions to the future. Um, in the context of blockchains, however, an oracle is a system that can answer questions that are external to Ethereum. Ideally, oracles are systems that are trustless, meaning that they don't need to be trusted because they operate on decentralized principles. And we'll be talking about this in more detail. Uh, just a quick uh, license and disclaimer. Uh, yeah, this slide deck includes some content from the Mastering Ethereum GitHub site by Andreas and Gavin. I'd like to thank them for making their content available under the Creative Commons license. Everything in this slide presentation, as well as the video, is available under the Creative Commons license. And all this stuff is my opinion only, so it does not, uh, it's not the opinion of my employer or anyone else. And none of what I'm saying here should be construed as investment advice or legal advice. This is for educational purposes only. All right, so we're gonna dive into why do we need oracles on a blockchain? Then we'll talk about some oracle use cases and examples. We'll take a look at some design patterns for oracles. We'll talk about authenticating data in an oracle context. Uh, we'll talk about uh, computation oracles and decentralized or oracles. And we'll talk about some Oracle client interfaces in the, so the Solidity programming language that Ethereum uses. So a key component of the Ethereum platform is that it, the Ethereum virtual machine uh, with its ability to execute programs and update the state of Ethereum constrained by consensus rules. Uh, you know, on any node in, in the decentralized network, uh, in order to maintain consensus, the Ethereum virtual machine execution is deterministic and is based only on the shared context of the Ethereum state and the signed contracts. Um, this has several important um, consequences. The first is that there can be no intrinsic source of randomness for the Ethereum virtual machine. That is, you can't roll a six-sided die on an Ethereum virtual machine and have two different nodes reach a different result. Um, you know, so smart contracts, you know, have to reach the same result if they do perform a mathematical computation in order for all the nodes to be in consensus. The second is that extrinsic data can only be introduced as a data payload of a transaction. Because if you remember how our protocol works for Ethereum, um, basically you, you can be sending a value, which is currency, or you can be sending a data payload, which is really being uh, sent it to a function to be executed in that contract. So any internal randomness in, in an Ethereum virtual machine would make the EVM non-deterministic and that would violate our protocol because then you'd have different nodes reaching different results. So, so let's think about this. To understand the uh, prohibition of a uh, true random function in the uh, Ethereum virtual machine to provide randomness for smart contracts, consider the effect on attempts to achieve consensus after the execution of such a function. Um, you know, node A would execute the command and store three on behalf of the smart contract in its storage, while node B executing the same smart contract might at roll store the number six instead. 
Um, therefore, the nodes A and B came to different conclusions about what the resulting state should be. And despite having run exactly the same code in the same context, you know, in this case, they're running the role of a, a, a random D6 and they come up with a random number. Uh, and so you could have a different resulting state every time a smart contract is running that. And therefore, there'd be no way for the network with thousands of nodes running independently around the world to ever come to a decentralized consensus on what the resulting state should be. Um, and furthermore, you could have uh, other effects that would make it even worse. Um, and so in general, um, we've got this uh, idea that Ethereum programs have to be deterministic. They can't be non-deterministic. Um, note that uh, something else to think about is that pseudo random functions like cryptographically secure hash functions which are deterministic and therefore can be part of the Ethereum virtual machine are not enough for many applications. Take a gambling game that simulates coin flips to resolve bet payouts. That gambling game that's simulating coin flips needs to randomize heads or tails. Um, so let's imagine now the miner is going to play that game. The miner gets an advantage by playing, could, could get an advantage by playing a game and only including the transactions and blocks for which they win. So how do you get around that problem? Since all nodes can agree on the contents of signed transactions, extrinsic information, including sources of randomness, price information, weather forecasts, and so on, can be introduced as the data part of a transaction sent to the network. However, such data uh, is not necessarily to be trusted because it comes from an unverifiable source, unlike a transaction that's signed by a digital signature. So this is a problem. And so how do we solve this problem? Well, we can use oracles to solve these problems. So let's talk about it. Ideally, you know, your oracles can provide this trustless a uh, trustless way of getting off-chain sources of information, like real-world information or off-chain information, such as the results of football games, the price of gold, or random numbers, onto the Ethereum platform for smart contracts to then use. Um, it could be used to relay data securely to a decentralized app front end directly. Oracles can therefore be thought of as a mechanism for bridging the gap between the off-chain world and smart contracts, allowing smart contracts to enforce con contractual relationships based on real world events and data will broaden the scope of what smart contracts can do dramatically. However, this can also introduce external risks to uh, Ethereum security model. Consider a smart contract that distributes assets when a person dies, essentially a smart will. Uh, this is something frequently discussed in the smart contract space and highlights the risk of a trusted oracle. If the inheritance amount controlled by the oracle contract is high enough, there might be an incentive to hack the oracle and trigger the distribution of assets before the owner dies. Um, so, some oracles provide data that's specific to a particular private data source, such as academic certificates or government IDs. Uh, the source of such data, such as a university or government department, might be trustworthy because it's got a trustworthy reputation. Um, and this particular source is considered the single authority on what that data should be. But arguably then that data shouldn't be provided trustlessly without tr a source as there's no independently verifiable objective truth beyond that particular department. So you need to think about different types of data sources and what our definition is of what counts as an Oracle. Because this is because these data sources are essentially gonna be a data bridge or a data source for smart contracts. And you think you can think about the data provided by oracles as being in the form of an attestation, such as a passport or a record of achievement. So attestations might become a big part of the success of blockchain platforms in the future, particularly in relation to the related issues of verifying identity or verifying reputation. So it's important to explore how uh, that can be connected to a blockchain platform. 
So here are some examples of data that could be provided by an Oracle. So random numbers, uh, sometimes referred to as entropy or randomness from physical sources, such as quantum thermal processes, uh, so that you can fairly select a winner in a lottery smart contract. Uh, parametric triggers indexed to natural hazards, a uh, triggering of catastrophic catastrophic bond smart contracts, such as a Richter scale measurement from an earthquake bond. Uh, exchange rate data for accurate pegging of cryptocurrencies to fiat currency. Uh, capital market data for pricing uh, tokenized assets and securities. Uh, benchmark reference data incorporating interest rates into smart financial derivatives. Uh, static and pseudo static data like security identifiers, country codes, currency codes, and so on. Time and interval data for event triggers grounded in precise time measurements. Um, some additional examples weather data, uh, for example, insurance premium calculations based on weather forecasts. Uh, political events uh, for prediction market resolution, like we're predicting whether uh, Biden or Trump is going to win. Uh, sporting events uh, for prediction market resolution, like we're predicting ahead of time who's going to win this, the Super Bowl, but then you have to pay out after someone wins the Super Bowl. Uh, we could also do the same thing for fantasy sports contracts. Uh, you know, predicting how many yards your favorite uh, sports star is going to get or how many points that sports star is going to score and then paying out once those point that those targets are reached uh geolocation data uh is used in supply chain tracking uh damage verification for insurance contracts uh, events occurring on other blockchains uh, interoperability functions between multiple blockchains uh even looking at the uh, market price of ether because remember there's no direct way to get the market price of ether if you're interacting on the ethereum blockchain uh, you normally have to go to an exchange to get that price or look at a uh, a, a data feed site um flight statistics as used by groups and clubs for flight ticket pooling and so on. So this is just some of the many examples of how data could be used in smart contracts if that external data was available on the blockchain. So all oracles are, are implemented in, a, in following several different patterns. Now, again, this is all brand new technology and this is rapidly changing. And so the design patterns I'm gonna list here are just some examples. There are gonna be oracles implemented that don't follow these design patterns. And in fact, some of these design patterns may be replaced in the future. But here's some examples of some early looks at how to implement oracles, uh, including things like computation oracles, decentralized oracles, and Oracle clients in Solidity. So the idea is that the Oracle is going to provide um, several key functions, including the ability to collect data from an off-chain source, uh, the ability to transfer the data from that off-chain source into the, onto the chain uh, with a digitally signed message, and the ability to make that data available by putting it into a smart contract storage where you can then access the data. Once the data is available in the smart contract storage, it can be accessed by other smart contracts on the blockchain through message calls that invoke a retrieve function of the Oracle smart contract. It can also be accessed by Ethereum nodes or network enabled clients directly by looking into the Oracle storage. There are three main ways to set up an Oracle. Uh, an Oracle could be categorized as request response. Uh, it could be categorized as pub sub or publish describe, or it could be categorized as immediate read. So let's talk about uh, what those categories are. So let's start with the uh, simplest, which is the immediate read uh, oracles. Um, these oracles provide data that's only needed for an immediate decision, like what is the address for ethereumbook.info, or is this person over 18? So those wishing to query this kind of data do so on a just-in-time basis. The lookup is done when the information is needed and possibly never again. Examples of such oracles include those that hold data about or issued by organizations, such as academic certificates. 
uh, or dial codes or institutional memberships or airport identifiers or self-sovereign IDs and so on. This type of Oracle stores data once in its contract storage where any other smart contract can look it up by using a request call to the Oracle contract. It can be, uh, that data can be updated. Um, the data in the Oracle storage is also available for direct lookup by blockchain enabled applications without having to go through and incur the gas costs of issuing a transaction. A shop wanting to check the age of a customer wishing to purchase alcohol could use an Oracle in this way. Uh, this type of Oracle is attractive to uh, organizations or companies that might otherwise have to run and maintain servers to answer such data requests. Note that the data stored by the Oracle is likely to not be the raw data that the Oracle is serving for efficiency or privacy reasons. A university might set up an Oracle for the certificates of academic achievement of past students. However, the full detail of the certificates, which could be pages of courses taken and grades achieved, would be too much data to store on the blockchain. Instead, what you would do is you'd store a hash of the certificate on the blockchain um, that can then be confirmed by recomputing the hash. Similarly, a government might wish to put citizen IDs onto the block on blockchain, where clearly the details on the, the specific ID needs to be kept private. So what you could do is you could hash the data, store the hash in a, in a Merkle tree, and only store the root hash in the smart contract. And then when someone wants to verify that that ID is valid, they could then recompute that hash and compare it against the, uh, the hash that's on the blockchain. So let's talk about the second category. The second category is publish, subscribe, or pub sub. And this category, an Oracle effectively provides a broadcast service for data that is expected to change, perhaps uh, both regularly and frequently. Um, and that data is either pulled by a smart contract on chain or watched by an off chain uh, application for updates. This category has a pattern similar to RSS feeds, web sub, and that sort of thing, where the Oracle is updated with new information and it signals that new data is available to those who consider themselves subscribed. Interested parties either pull the Oracle to check whether the latest information has changed or they listen to updates to the Oracle contracts and act when the update occurs. Examples of this type of Oracle can include price feeds, um, weather contracts, and other similar types of information, maybe economics, traffic data, social statistics, and so on. Uh, polling can be inefficient in the world of web servers, but not as, as inefficient uh, when you're talking about peer-to-peer uh, -peer contacts of blockchain platforms. Ethereum clients, have to keep up with all the state changes, including changes to contract storage. So polling for data changes it would essentially be a local call to a synced peer-to-peer -peer client. Um, Ethereum event logs make it particularly easy for applications to look out for Oracle updates. And so this design pattern can in some ways uh, be even, even be considered to be a sort of like a push service. However, if the polling is done from a smart contract, which might be necessary for some decentralized applications, then you might run into uh, significant problems with gas. So we wouldn't recommend that you do polling from a smart contract. All right, let's talk about the request response category. The request response category is the most complicated uh, design pattern. This is where the data space is too large to be stored in a smart contract and users are expected to only need a small part of the overall data set at a time. It's also an applicable model for data provider businesses. In practical terms, such an Oracle might be implemented as a system of on-chain smart contracts and off-chain infrastructure used to monitor requests and retrieve and return data. A request for data from the decentralized application is typically gonna be an asynchronous process involving a number of steps. In this design pattern, uh, an end user owned uh, account, you know, essentially someone's wallet is going to transact with a decentralized application resulting in an interaction with a function defined in the Oracle smart contract. This function will initiate a request to the Oracle with the associated arguments detailing the data requested. In addition to supplementary information that might include callback functions and scheduling parameters. Once the transaction has been validated, 
the Oracle can request can be observed as an Ethereum virtual machine event that's emitted by the Oracle contract or as a state change. The arguments can be retrieved and used to perform the actual query of an off-chain data source. The Oracle may also require payment for processing the request because you're going to be processing transactions to cover all the gas. Um, and there might be a callback involved, and so you need additional gas for that and permissions to access the requested data. Finally, the resulting data is signed by the Oracle owner, attesting the validity of the data at a particular time and delivered to the transaction to the decentralized application that made the original request, either directly or via an Oracle contract. Depending on scheduling parameters, the Oracle may broadcast further transactions, updating the data at regular intervals, for example, end of day pricing information. Um, so just looking at the steps, sort of detailed here, because this is kind of complicated. Um, so first we receive a query from a decentralized application and we want to know something that the Oracle knows. We parse out the query uh, to see exactly what, what's being requested. Then we check that the uh, payment to cover all the gas uh, for all the transactions are going to be necessary and the data access permissions to access this data from this data source are provided. Then assuming that we got paid, we retrieve the relevant data from off-chain source and encrypt it if necessary. We sign the transaction with the data that's included, broadcast the transaction to the network, and schedule any further transactions such as notifications and so on. You know, there are a lot of other approaches that are possible to how you might set up an Oracle. For example, data can be requested from uh, and and returned directly by an externally owned account, removing the need for an Oracle smart contract. Similarly, the request response could be made to and from an internet of things, enabled hardware sensor. So Oracles could be human, software, AI, hardware, and so on. Uh, the request response pattern that I described above uh, is commonly see seen in client server architectures. While that's a useful messaging pattern that allows applications to have a two-way conversation, uh, it's not always the best solution. For example, a smart bond requiring an interest rate from Oracle might have to request the data on a daily basis under a request response pattern in order to ensure the rate's always correct. Given that interest rates uh, change infrequently, a pub subscribe pattern might be more appropriate, uh, especially when taking into account uh, the cost of doing things on Ethereum. Publish subscribe is a pattern where the publishers i.e. the oracles, don't send messages directly to the receivers, but instead categorize the published messages in distinct classes. Subscribers are able to express an interest in one or more topics and retrieve only those messages that are of interest to them. Under such a pub sub pattern, an oracle might write the interest rate to its own internal storage each time it changes. Multiple subscribe decentralized apps can simply read it from the oracle contract, thereby reducing the impact on network bandwidth while minimizing uh, storage costs. Um, so there's a lot of possibilities for how to do this. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and these different patterns are gonna be relevant in different areas. For example, a broadcast pattern might be appropriate where the Oracle doesn't need to know the identity of the subscribing contracts. Uh, let's talk about data authentication. If we assumed the source of the data being queried by a decentralized app is both authoritative and trustworthy, which is a, a safe, um, reasonable assumption, um, an outstanding question remains. Given that the Oracle and the request response mechanism may be operated by distinct entities, how are we able to trust this mechanism? There's a distinct possibility that data could be tampered with. You know, even if the blockchain is somewhat resistant to being hacked, uh, what if your off-chain data source has been hacked? How do you trust that data? So it's critical that off-chain methods are able to attest to the data's integrity. Two common approaches to data authentication are authenticity proofs and trusted execution environments. And so we're going to talk about each of those in a little more detail. So let's talk about authenticity proofs. Authenticity proofs are cryptographic guarantees that data has not been tampered with. Based on a variety of attestation techniques, for example, digitally signed proofs, they effectively shift the trust from the data carrier to the attester, who's the provider of the attestation. 
By verifying the authenticity proof on chain, smart contracts are able to verify the integrity of the data before operating on it. Uh, Oracleize is an example of an Oracle service leveraging a variety of authenticity proofs. One such proof that's currently available for data queries from the Ethereum main network is the TLS notary proof. Um, a TLS notary proof allows a client to provide evidence to a third party that HTTPS web traffic occurred between the client and the server. While HTTPS is itself secure, it, HTTPS does not support data signing. So as a result, TLS notary proofs rely on TLS notary via page signer certifications. And so the TLS notary proofs leverage the TLS let protocol, the transport layer security protocol, enabling the TLS master key, which signs the data after it's been accessed to be split between three parties, the server, i.e. the Oracle, an oddity, which is Oracleize, and an auditor. Oracleize uses um, a virtual machine instance as the auditor, which can be verified as having been unmodified since it was in created as an instance. This uh, instance will store the TLS notary secret, allowing it to provide honesty proofs. Although it offers higher assurances against data tampering than a peer request response mechanism, the approach does require the assumption that um, the hosted instance uh, is not going to be tampering with the VM and that the hacker doesn't have access to that instance where we're actually doing all the signing. Town Crier is an example of a trusted execution environment. It's an authenticated data feed Oracle system based on the trusted execution environment approach. Uh, it utilizes hardware-based secure enclaves to ensure data integrity. Uh, Town Crier itself uses uh, Intel's software guard extension to ensure that responses from HPS queries can be verified as authentic. Uh, SGX provides guarantees of integrity, ensuring that applications running within the enclave are protected against the CPU by the CPU against tampering by other processes. It also provides confidentiality, ensuring that the application state is opaque to other processes when running within the enclave. Uh, finally, SGX allows attestation by generating a digitally signed proof that an application which is securely identified by a hash of its build is actually running within the enclave. By verifying this digital signature, it's possible for a decentralized application to prove that a town crier instance is running securely within an SGX enclave. This in turn proves that the instance hasn't been tampered with and that the data emitted by town crier is therefore authentic. The confidentiality priority property additionally enables town crier to handle private data by allowing data queries to be encrypted using the town crier's instance's public key. Operating an Oracle query response mechanism within an enclave such as SDX effectively allows us to think of it as running securely on trusted third-party hardware, ensuring that the requested data is returned tamper, untampered with, assuming that we trust uh the intel software guard extension is doing everything it needs to do if there's a bug or a vulnerability in that then of course um the data would be exposed to hackers let's talk about computation oracles um so far we've only discussed oracles in the context of requesting and delivering data however oracles can also be used to perform arbitrary computation a function that can be especially useful given ethereum's inherent block uh, gas limit and comparatively expensive computation costs. Rather than just relaying the results of a query, computation oracles can be used to perform computation on a set of inputs and return a calculated result that may have been extremely inefficient to calculate on chain. For example, one might use a computation oracle to perform a computationally intensive regression calculation in order to estimate the yield of a bond contract. So if you're willing to trust a centralized but auditable service, you can go again to something like Oracleize. Uh, Oracleize can provide a service that allows decentralized applications 
to request the output of a computation performed in a sandbox virtual machine. Um, you know, the sandbox VM instance creates an executable container from a user configured Docker file packed in an archive that is uploaded to the interplanetary file system IPFS. On request, Oracleize retrieves this archive using a tash and then initializes and executes a Docker, con Docker container on your VM platform, passing any arguments that are provided to the application as an environment variable. Uh, the containerized application performs the calculation subject to a time constraint and writes the result to a standard input where it can be retrieved by Oracleize and returned to the decentralized application. Oracleize currently offers this service as an audible uh, micro instance, so if the computation of some, is of some non-trivial value, it's possible to check that the correct Docker container is executed. However, that isn't really a truly decentralized uh, solution. The concept of a cryptlet as a standard for verifiable Oracle truths has been formalized as part of Microsoft's uh, ESC framework. Uh, cryptlets execute within an encrypted capsule that abstracts away the infrastructure, such as the input output. It has the crypto delegate attached to it so that incoming and outgoing messages are signed, validated, and proven automatically. Cryptlets support distributed transactions so that contract, smart contract logic can take on complicated multi step, multi blockchain external system transactions supporting the ACID transaction management properties. This allows developers to create portable, isolated, and private resolutions uh, of the truth for use in smart contracts. Uh, for a more decentralized solution, however, we can look at Truebit. Truebit offers a solution for scalable and verifiable off-chain computation. They use a system of solvers and verifiers who are incentivized to perform computations and verification of those computations respectively. Should a solution be challenged, an iterative verification process on subsets of the computation is performed on chain. Uh, which is sort of a verification game. The verification game proceeds through a series of rounds, uh, each round recursively checking a smaller and smaller subset of the computation. The game eventually reaches a final round where the challenge is sufficiently trivial such that the judges, which are the Ethereum miners, can make a final ruling on whether the challenge was met on chain. In effect, Truebit is an implementation of a computation market allowing decentralized applications to pay for verifiable computation to be performed outside of the network, but relying on Ethereum to enforce the rules of the verification game. In theory, this enables trustless smart contracts to securely perform any computation task. So a broad range of applications exist for systems like Truebit, ranging from machine learning to verification and proof of work. Um, an example, the latter would be like the Dogecoin uh, Ethereum bridge, which uses Truebit to verify Dogecoin's proof of work, uh, which is a memory hard and computationally intensive function that can't be computed within the Ethereum uh, limit on gas. By performing this verification in Truebit, it's possible to securely verify Dogecoin transactions within a smart contract on Ethereum's testnet. So let's talk about decentralized oracles in more detail. So while centralized data or computation oracles suffice for many applications, they represent a single point of failure uh, in the Ethereum network. A number of uh, proposals have been developed around the idea of decentralized oracles as a means of ensuring data availability and the creation of a network of individual data providers with an on-chain data aggregation system. Um, Chainlink and Shelling Coin are two of many different proposals. So I'll take a quick look at these two. So Chainlink has proposed a decentralized Oracle network consisting of three key smart contracts, a reputation contract, an order matching contract, and an aggregation contract, and an off-chain registry of data providers. The reputation contract is used to keep track of data providers' performances. Scores in the reputation contract are used to populate the off-chain registry. Uh, the order matching contract selects bids from oracles using the reputation contract. It then finalizes a service level agreement, which includes query parameters and the number of oracles required. So essentially, the purchaser doesn't have to transact with the individual oracles directly. 
The aggregation contract then collects responses submitted using a commit reveal scheme from multiple oracles, calculates the final collected results of the query, and finally feeds results back into the reputation contract. One of the main challenges with such a decentralized approach is the formulation of the aggregation function. Um, Chainlink proposes calculating a weighted response, allowing a validity skill to be reported for each Oracle response. Detecting an invalid score here um, would be have an issue since it relies on the premise that outlying data points measured by deviations from responses provided by peers are incorrect. Calculating a validity score based on the location of an Oracle response among a distribution of responses risks penalizing correct answers over average ones. So Chainlink offers a standard set of aggregation contracts, but also allows customized aggregation contracts to be specified. Um, Chainlink also has a verifiable random function, which allows the Oracle to provide a source of randomness to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Ethereum is designed to be deterministic and doesn't natively support randomization because each node has to reach the same result. So Chainlink VRF essentially provides this Oracle that's providing your off-chain source of randomness, enabling blockchain applications that depend on random numbers like lotteries and so on. So let's talk about the shelling coin protocol, which is a related idea. Under the shelling coin protocol, multiple participants report values and the median is taken as the correct answer. Reporters are required to provide a deposit that is redistributed in favor of values that are closer to the median, thereby incentivizing the reporting of values that are similar to others. A common value, also known as a shelling point, which respondents might consider as a natural and obvious target around which to coordinate, is expected to be close to the actual value. Um, another approach that's been suggested is to have a decentralized off-chain data availability oracle that design leverages a dedicated proof-of-work blockchain that is able to uh, correctly report on whether or not registered data is available during a particular time period. Miners attempt to download, store, and propagate all the currently registered data, thereby guaranteeing the data is available locally. Uh, while such a system might be expensive in the sense that every mining node stores and propagates all the registered data, the system allows storage to be reused by releasing data after the registration period ends. All right, let's talk about cl Oracle client interfaces and Solidity. Um, so here's an example of using Oracleize to update the exchange rate for ETH and dollars from an external source. Um, so basically, we've got some code here to show us an ETH USD price ticker. Um, and I'm not going to go through all of this code, but uh, here's, you know, it's basically showing you the contract here. Um, and we could take a look at this in. You could take this and put this into you know your favorite IDE um, and take a look at it and try it out. But I'm not going to go through this. But the important part is you know obviously you've got your function that's your ticker that's a payable function um, that's leveraging Oracle eyes, and we've got a callback function, um, and we've got a query ticker function for querying the ticker, um, and so on. Um, and to integrate with uh, Oracleize, the contract above in its, uh, you know, the ETH USD price ticker has to be inherent from um, using Oracleize. Um, the using Oracleize parent contract, smart contract, is defined in the Oracleize API file. Um, the data request is made using the Oracleize query function, which is inherited from this uh, parent contract, the using Oracleize contract. Uh, and so essentially what we're doing in the Oracleize query function is we're override, overloading the function and providing the arguments that need to, some arguments that need to be uh, provided. Uh, the supported data source to be used, whether it's a URL, Wolfram app, uh, IPFS, computation, and so on, and the argument for the given data source, which can include uh, JSON, XML, parsing helpers. 
Um, the price query is performed in our query ticker function or perform the query. Oracle Eyes requires a payment of a small fee in Ether that's going to cover all the gas for the Oracle processing the result and then transmit it to the callback function. And, and, and then they also charge a little bit for the service as well. Uh, the amount that's being charged is dependent on the data source and the type of authenticity proof that's required. Once the data has been retrieved by the callback, the callback function will then be called by the Oracleized controlled account. Um, it'll pass in the response value and a unique query ID argument, which for example, uh, can be used to handle and track multiple pending callbacks from Oracleize. So um, financial provider Thompson Reuters also provides an Oracle service for Ethereum that is called Block One. IQ, which allows market and reference data to be requested by smart contracts running on private or permission networks. Um, here, we're going to show a contract that's calling the Block One IQ service for market data, showing in the interface the Oracle and a client contract that will make the request. So, we've, again, we've got our basic contract here. Uh, again, we've got several functions, initiating, initializing the request, adding arguments to the request, executing the request, getting the responses, and so and deleting the response. Um, and then we've got another contract uh, that's, that's working with it that has like functions for the Oracle client, getting the intraday, handling success, handling failure, and so on. Um, and so basically what this uh, contract is going to do is we've got our uh, the data request is going to be initialized using the init request function, which allows a query type in this example. Uh, for, for example, for a request for an intraday price to be specified in addition to several callback functions. Um, you know, again, remember callback functions are where you call a system and then they call you back. It's kind of like uh, playing phone tag. Um, as opposed to a synchronous connection where you're calling and then they're sending you a message back. In this case, we send them a message and then sometime later they'll send us a message back. Um, so, and so this is just diving into some of the functions. You know, the constructor is going to call the Oracle reference by the address and invoke the get intraday function. For example, here we're looking up a IBM stock code and providing the timestamp is when we want to get that price. And in the function for get intraday, we're going to take the router's instrument code and the timestamp, call the Oracle, and then execute the request and pass it in these arguments. And here we got our callbacks. And in the case of a successful request processing, the handle success callback function is invoked, allowing the requested data to be retrieved. Uh, showing us the open, high, low, close, and bid ask prices for this particular function. And if something went wrong in retrieving the data, it would then call the failure callback, and you know you'd, you'd see an error message. So, in summary, as you can see, oracles provide a crucial service to smart contracts. They bring external facts to contract execution, enabling contracts to perform actions based on what's going on in the real world. We, we're not just relying on what's on the actual blockchain. However, oracles also provide a significant risk. Um, even if the oracle is trusted, what if that oracle gets co compromised by a hacker? That could result in compromised execution in the smart contracts uh, that's performing events based on the data feed. Uh, generally, when considering the use of an Oracle, be very careful about the trust model. Uh, in fact, I am going to do a separate lecture diving into different types of trust models for how you can trust um, those off-chain data sources. Uh, if you assume the Oracle can be trusted um, and you improperly make that assumption, you may be undermining the security of your smart contract by exposing it to potentially false inputs. However, that being said, oracles can be very useful if your security model is a good one. Uh, decentralized oracles can resolve some of these concerns and offer Ethereum smart contracts uh, a trustless approach to external data. However, choose carefully and you can start exploring the bridge between Ethereum and the real world, real world data that oracles offer. 
So thanks again for tuning in to this episode of the Understanding Crypto series by Thomas Plunkett. Tune in next time when I'm going to dive deeper into another Ethereum topic.